So when you take a look at your finger, let's all try that. Just take your finger, okay, and look at it. It looks very solid, right? But in fact, that perception is illusory because as you zero in more and more to finer scales, you will see if you could bring your finger under the microscope that there are molecules that are coming off the finger. So what appears to the eye at this particular scale may not, in fact, be the same at a different scale. For biological systems, we go from the earth, ecosystem, organism, down to the tissues, cells, organelles, biomolecules, and we believe eventually to the atoms, the molecules, the atoms, the nuclei, the particles, and eventually we believe the strings, superstrings. So here is the concept of scales, and we observe the scales. And as Nancy said before, the various laws that apply at each scale don't apply at other scales. So there's a certain complementarity here, which was defined in the 20s and 30s as the foundation, one of the foundation principles of quantum theory that basically says that reality is made of modalities, of modes of description, which are complementary to each other, but which don't derive from each other. So now we are in the stage where the principles that apply the quantum level, we see that they apply at biological levels and beyond. For the brain, there is something like nine orders of magnitude here between the large physical brain down to the nanoscale. How is that marvelous organ called the brain operate over these vast scales, where at the nanoscales you have the molecules, and presumably further down becomes a quantum soup, to something that eventually gives us awareness or at least awareness operates through the brain. I don't want to spend too much time, except to say that in the case of psychology, for example, it now appears that measurement observation is as essential as it is for the quantum systems. So what we used to think are primarily quantum principles now seem to apply at biological levels and psychology. And therefore, I think I showed this last year, is still valid. Perhaps reality is described in these complementary relationships that go into deeper and deeper layers. And at that point, we can pick up the discussion with Deepak. I think the basic question here is, is science a method to explore? And tonight we're going to have um, many people on, on the panel here. And what we're going to try and figure out is what are the limitations of science when it comes to ult understanding ultimate reality, if there are limitations, OK? Or is there such a thing as ultimate reality? Um, I quote here John Wheeler. Uh, when he says that um, every particle, every field of force, even the fabric of space-time itself derives its meaning, derives its 
significance derives its reality from apparatus elicited answers to questions we ask. Uh, Heisenberg uh, says that uh, uh, science examines not nature as it is, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. Uh, we are trying to figure out the connection here between the brain and consciousness. And trying to see how does the brain produce consciousness. But even in saying that, we are actually going to a metaphysical assumption that the brain does indeed produce consciousness. That's a, there's no proof that it does, you know. Um, science is an activity in consciousness. Science is based on a loop of theory, observation, experimentation. Theories are conceived in consciousness. Experiments are designed in consciousness. Observations are made in consciousness. And we don't have an explanation for consciousness. Or do we? We don't have an explanation for consciousness in the current scientific paradigm. Because the current scientific paradigm looks at objects. You have to have the object subject. And in fact, ultimately, that, that is the ultimate complementarity that we're talking about. So to study the self-awareness, awareness self, as an object is almost an oxymoron. I think it is an oxymoron, because we cannot take that observing self outside and examine it as an object. We can do it introspectively. We can do it in meditation or when we turn within. But ultimately, we cannot account for it as an objective reality because it is the one that is asking the questions. I think that's, that's your point. And therefore, for the brain, consciousness, human consciousness, operates through the brain. But the same way that the TV program or a great movie is not generated in the TV, but it's generated somewhere else, and then the TV projects it, perhaps in the same way consciousness is projected through the human brain. So uh, we saw these beautiful uh, videos from Joel, Primack, Nancy Abrams, nice. all those stars, galaxies, billions of them, galactic systems, yes. all of that. We, where did we experience all that? In our consciousness, right? We experienced it in our consciousness. We were thinking or we're feeling perhaps as we're looking at these galaxies, we're traveling billions of light years away, but we're sitting on our chairs. And I remember uh, you were at that uh, um, discussion with uh, Steve Hawking, I remember about a year or a year and a half ago when you were talking about uh, perhaps two world views of uh, science and spirituality, and uh, he was denying, of course, all of that. And uh, then at some point he said, um, I roam through the universe with my mind. And I said, yes, Steve Hawking, you're roaming th through the universe with your mind. We roam through the universe with our minds. There's no boundary to our consciousness in that sense. But the physical body, of course, is bound here. So is consciousness then always the observer? The term consciousness is a lot of term and that one of the problems is that it means different things to neuroscientists it means different things to a yogi it means different things to perhaps an ancient uh, sage um, what i would like to say is that consciousness that has objective that that observes objects is operates through the brain and that's the human consciousness of course, it's not only humans who believe that dolphins have it, and perhaps through these various levels that we see, maybe it propagates all the way down to the most unimaginable small scales, as well as the larger scales. We're not sure about that. We cannot prove it, because again, it is we ourselves that we are doing so the observance. When I was looking at those videos, yes. I saw those beautiful pictures. 
if you saw my brain, you wouldn't see those pictures. You'd see electrochemical activity, right? There would be electrochemical activity. What's the connection between the electrochemical activity and those pictures? Uh, again, the analogy would be, what is the, uh, the connection between the uh, electric currents in the circuitry of, um, um, of a TV and the program that shows you a great epic that you observe? So the, your currents going, without the currents, you cannot see it, that there will be no, no message. But the message is encoded, and then it's played through the particular instrumentation that you have. Explain non-locality for a moment. Non-locality came out of quantum theory, um, and uh, basically um, is tied together to entanglement. Um, in a famous thought experiment that eventually was put to test called the EPR, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen experiment. Um, and that's one type of non-locality because there are others. Basically, you have uh, two particles that are preparing a particular quantum state, they're entangled, and they move apart. And when you make a measurement, because according to quantum theory, the properties of one particle or the, or the two particles or the system particles don't take actual values until an observation is made, uh, takes place. So one is flying apart, you make a measurement here, let's say now you pick a particular direction of a vector, let's say, or spin of a particle, okay? Immediately, and now we know it's actually immediately, the other particle assumes a complementary value. That's no locality, because it can happen at speeds Essentially, it happens at infinite speeds. The two particles are always connected. So um, am I asking a question of a particular behavior of nature or cosmos here determines the answer there? I tickle the universe here and laughs there as well. Well, instantly. that would be a poetic way to put it. In the quantum, in the quantum, in the quantum uh, reality, it actually has to do with physical properties that are measured um, here and immediately the other part reacts. But it seems now, and this is what I was saying with these complementarity principles, that what applies at the quantum realm, we believe, are generalized principles that apply at all levels. And perhaps what we have in the brain is quantum processes at certain level, but then quantum-like properties that appear as quantum. There's certain non-locality, non but it's not the EPR non-locality. There's global um, synchronicity in the brain, for example. So those principles seem to apply perhaps at every level. And it is these principles that in my mind is perhaps the way to approach consciousness in a scientific sense because we're not making much progress other, otherwise. If we try to build it from bottom up in a reductionist approach, it just doesn't work. So perhaps the principles that you mentioned, mathematical things that are applying at every level which manifest at the quantum level, at the biological level, at the psychological level, and perhaps at the cosmic level. So you just said mathematical level. Where is mathematics? Mathemat Where does mathematics exist? Does it exist in the cosmos, or does it um, exist in the mathematician's mind? Plato, Plato would say that it exists in a sphere of, um, of pure um, ideas. Uh, in a modern sense, um, if there is a transcendence, to mathematics, and I believe actually there is a transcendence mathematics. I think Einstein also believed that. Um, that there is a mathematical reality, but in order for it to manifest, it manifests through our minds. So it is really the conscious awareness of human beings that creates the mathematics that then we use as a language for the universe, to understand the universe. You know, Stuart Hameroff and um, Sir Roger Penrose, uh, in their particular mm -hmm. way of expressing it, talk about Planck scale space-time geometry, uh, which is 25 orders smaller in order of magnitude than an atom. Right. And uh, I think Stuart is here, and maybe he can correct me, but uh, according to him and Penrose, at this level, um, everything, in a sense, disappears. The, there's no space-time, no energy, right. no matter. Uh, there are only possibilities, and they're all... Uh, in their language, quantum entangled, they exist. The raw materials of the universe, such as spin, charge, gravity, whatever, they exist as possibility, and they're all uh, quantum ent entangled. But according to them, this is the level of platonic truth and uh, uh, mathematical truth. 
and uh, the evolutionary impulse of, um, of truth, goodness, beauty, harmony that we call the universe. Would you uh, be sympathetic to that idea? I would be sympathetic up to a certain point because the, what the platonic ideas that I believe we're talking about are beyond space and time. And, and it is true that when you get to the Planck level, you are reaching the end of space time. But our mind always says, well, what is beyond the Planck level? What is beyond space time? So perhaps there's a transcendence level that even space time descriptions don't do it any good, don't do it any justice. And these perhaps are states, as you describe them in your various books, yogic states where we have awareness, but at some point without objects of awareness. And these are deep states that seem to exist. They have to do with brain activity. We can study them. They, they are very real, but there's no objectified reality in the sense that we, we perceive it with our eyes open. So would you say that uh, consciousness is non-local and local at the same time? Consciousness is non-local and local at the same time. Absolutely correct. Uh, the cosmic consciousness that I think um, Nancy was referring to is um, the cosmic view of the universe, and that's certainly non-local, but it be takes a part particular localized aspect through our brains. And if our brains, as Rudy was telling us, gets through some sort of uh, ill situation or because of Alzheimer's or whatever, then the hardware begins to break down. And when the hardware breaks down, then if I can be simplistic, the software doesn't work anymore. So we need the hardware to have it work in a human body with human awareness. But it seems to be a certain level of reality, you mentioned at the very beginning, the reality, that operates beyond the brain. And those are experienced in different le levels of meditation, different deep sleep or whatever. Deep sleep is different, of course, than the meditative state that uh, uh, you're talking about. And then the, the dream state, the REM state is also different, the awakened state is different. So these are different levels of awareness, but they are all part of us. And we seem to be focusing on this particular awareness with open eyes. And that is just as a particular slash through space-time, through reality. For us to say that we capture everything through that, I think it's at least presumptions on our part. So, you know, uh, this question is going to come up uh, again, and we have Professor Ramachandran here as well for a later discussion. I don't know if he's in the audience right now, but uh, uh, the question does come up that what we experience yeah. in every moment of our life is either form or color or taste or smell or uh, warmth or coolness or heaviness, right. dense and texture. These the qualia, the qualia. Qualia. Yeah. That we experience qualia. Right. And yet we try to quantify them in measurements. And that's what you're doing. You know, your quantum is a unit of measurement, right? right? But the measurement is also in consciousness, isn't it? The measurements in consciousness. And, and of course, the qualia that you mentioned are the qualitative aspects of consciousness. And then we have the quantitative. Now, the problem for the last three centuries, so 300 years or so, is that because of the great success of dynamical theory, particularly Newtonian theory and then quantum theory, we have come about to try to understand the universe as just a dynamical system. And that is one big aspect of the universe. But then there is the information part of the universe. And the information is not contained in the dynamics. And therefore, we have to always be careful because that, what you could term the reality, is much bigger than we imagine. And our science, the way I view it, I also believe that it will evolve, but it will have to have a dialogue with spirituality. If, we don't, if that dialogue doesn't occur, the world is in deep trouble. Both Nancy and, uh, and, uh, uh, and Joel, and to some extent uh, uh, Rudy, we in a sense addressed different scales of reality, yes. right? 
So when you describe the macroscop macroscopic scale, you use classical laws to describe it. Pretty much. Uh, pretty much. You Even general relativity can be considered as classical to a certain it's extent. Classical. You go to the quantum level, you have different. So are there different laws for different scales? Um, well, we believe that the constants of nature, for example, are the same. They apply everywhere. So there is a deep underlying physical constancy. Now, maybe the, the constants of nature themselves are changing. That's another story. But there is some basic foundation of the physical universe that operates at different scales. But it seems that the way we observe it, you know, this is not really solid when you get down to nanoscale. And eventually, when you get to the string level, it's just a bunch of strings flying around, if, if superstring theory is correct. So in that sense, the laws of physics that we view at this level don't apply at these other levels. Could this level, this material level, be just a gestalt of qualia in consciousness? A um, conglomeration of qualia? Conglomerate? Could you explain that a bit more? And then... Well, a qualia is a unit of, yeah. um, of awareness, just like a quantum is a unit of mass or energy, right? Energy, yeah. Correct? Yeah. We think in terms of quanta when we describe, say, quantum physics. Right. But we don't experience quanta, we experience qualia. We only experience qualia. We <laughs> only experience qualia. Right. So perhaps we should reverse our whole kind of model trying to explain qualia in terms of physical chemical reactions and say, in fact, even the physical, where do you experience the brain on a CAT scan or when you look at a neural network or your own body or your thoughts? Where are these experiences? And aren't they in the end all qualia? They're sensations or images or thoughts or feelings. That's all we experience, right? They are. That's all we experience. So your body is a sensation in consciousness. It is a sensation in consciousness. Interpreted um, as this material thing. And in fact, the things that really are dear and close to our hearts are these qualitative aspects. Art, right? Love, understanding, all these things. Uh, very few of us, I mean, I get great pleasure by solving partial differential equations, right? But in fact, those partial differential equations, they don't really by themselves mean very much. It is through them that we understand perhaps how the laws of physics of, of a star, circling black hole operates that bec becomes exciting. But it is excitement. And I think all the great scientists always point to that excitement that exists in science. So it is, it is a qualia. Freeman Dyson, uh, I believe, has written a new book uh, that Ramachandran was talking about. And uh, perhaps we'll get to hear more about it. But in one of his earlier works, and I think Joel knows Freeman Dyson too, in one of his earlier books, he said that uh, every experiment, in a sense, that you do forces a subatomic particle to make a choice. Is that true? Would you agree with that statement? There's, uh, quantum theory is uh, nothing more than uh, choices that are made through and observations. So who makes those choices? Um, ultimately, the, the observant self. There are many people here, physicists, who say that um, that's old quantum physics, that's Copenhagen. There are at least 11 other interpretations of quantum physics, and somehow we can do away with, uh, with the observer or consciousness uh, in those other theories. Um, I would be very happy if we could get rid of that observer. <laughs> um, because, um, indeed, um, as a scientist, we can't really account for it. So in some ways, um, it would be good so to get rid of it. But I've come to the conclusion that we cannot get rid of it. It is there from the beginning to the very end. It is with us, and it will always be with us. And for us to deny it, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Denial doesn't mean that you don't poof away. You don't say, OK, you disappear. I can deny you. I can say, Deepak, you don't exist. But you exist. You know you exist. So denial doesn't really mean that takes away the existence of certain things. And I think the, you know, our eye awareness is the deepest reality. Yeah, but again, in Eastern wisdom traditions, the eye, you know, if I say I, you use the word I too. But if I go inside the body, there's no I there. That's right. Right? 
uh, I go there, there's no such thing as an inner eye witnessing yeah. awareness. So in Eastern wisdom traditions, the eye itself is also a qualia within consciousness. But the eye that I'm talking about is the deep levels of awareness that are beyond objective reality. Beyond the subject-object Be split. Beyond the subject-object. So ultimately, the complementarities I was referring to, it is through those complementarities and through these observations that the universe manifests. But ultimately, the other side is the involution. And then, eventually, you reach a level that objects don't exist. That is called the witness consciousness. So the witness consciousness is, and I think we can sort of have a little hint if we maybe take a little experiment with the audience. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll ask everybody to just um, make yourselves comfortable and close your eyes for just a couple of minutes. And if any thoughts are coming and going, that's fine. Now, between the breaths, just follow your breath, but between the breaths, as the breath comes in and the breath comes out, there's a moment of silence. Just focus on that between in-breath and out-breath. And as you do, you will notice that the thoughts begin to dissolve away. Maybe not right away. It does matter. Just follow the breath. They say that space between the in-breath and the out-breath ultimately is the witness consciousness that we talk about. We can open our eyes. It's a simple exercise. You can do it at home. If there is a witness consciousness, then it must apply at every level. It cannot be an esoteric, mystical thing that exists somewhere else. It has to be here and now. So no one, I believe, will deny their own breath. And as far as I'm concerned, that's what I would call cosmic consciousness. Can it's we try time. something else? As you're listening to me right now, all of you, just turn your attention to who's listening. That's the witness consciousness. Yeah. So would you say that's in the discontinuity, that's in the space between space-time events? It is from that space that space-time events arise. And they dissolve back to into so I was recently at the Max Planck Institute, and yeah. somebody there was no longer using the word subatomic particles. They were calling them haps, happenings in happenings. consciousness. So a subatomic particle is a space-time event in consciousness. That's right. Would you be sympathetic a to that? Absolutely, notion? absolutely. It was Heraclitus, ancient Greece, who, who was one of the first philosophers who talked about everything moves. And he was talking about the process as being reality, not hard particles of Democritus, not the atoms. They don't exist. In and a even, way, when you observe something, yeah. you kind of freeze the, freeze the movement of consciousness. You, it's an artifact, isn't it? You freeze the frame. But when, as soon as you observe something, it has changed. Our, our cells, as you know, change. Within seven years, every cell in our body has, this, has changed, and only a few brain cells last for a lifetime. Not all of them, but... So what keeps this awareness, what keeps this wholeness in the body if the very cells of our body change all the time? It's a computer. If you want to use the analogy of computer, it's a computer that continuously invents itself. We have not built a computer like that yet, because the, the hardware in our computer is always there, right? It's the programs, programs that change. But in our case, the hardware itself changes. OK, we're going to run out of time, because we have lots of other very interesting discussions. But 
Uh, I just want to ask you two questions. Uh, one is uh, the BEM experiments that you're involved with. Uh, yes. Could you explain a little bit about them? Um, the BEM experiments were done by uh, BEM, a uh, ret uh, retired uh, professor at um, Cornell. Uh, there's nine, nine of them, and uh, actually he published again six of them. Very interesting. Basically, um, one of the experiments I'll just describe, I think it was number nine. Uh, subjects who were really students at Cornell were asked to um, not study for an exam. They're, they were told they were going to take an exam, okay, but they're not going to study an exam. So they took the exam, and then half of them, I believe, they were asked to study for the exam. And the other half never study. The ones who study the exam for the exam after they had taken the test actually turned out they did better in the test that they had already taken. You understand? So it is like a retrocausal. It is like the future is entangled with the past. Now, I think um, Henry Stapp will tell us a little bit about it more, and I also agree with Henry. I don't think it changes the hour of time. I think, the, at least in the physical sense. But it, there is a, a, a causal component, perhaps it is the principle of sufficient reason, which says that things happen because they have a meaning that enters the picture. In any case, uh, whatever the explanation, Ben's experiment are very, very intriguing. And again, it is the interface between psychology and physical systems that I was talking about, where the measurement in a psychological sense seems to be very, very important. And if indeed those experiments are held up, and I understand that eight, out, eight other experiments have been done, eight out of nine, and they are all confirmed, uh, those that have, will have profound implications. So talk about, just for a second, the arrow of time. Uh, is there an explanation in the laws of physics for the arrow of time? There is an explanation for the arrow of time in terms of even uh, classical uh, thermodynamics. Basically, it arises because of the uh, second law of thermodynamics, uh, because of processes uh, that take place, the uh, increase of the entropy, so to speak, which give you a direction of time. At the quantum level, uh, time can go in either direction. In fact, there is a theory by Aharonov uh, that you can have two arrows going back. And in fact, I, it was um, uh, Dirac himself who believed in two arrows of time because of the, you know, a positron can be considered as a, as a particle running back in time. So at the quantum level, time doesn't seem to have a preferred direction. At the cosmic level, it seems to have a direction. Now, these BAM experiments throw that whole idea of time into a little bit of a question, and I think we have to have a lot more thinking about it. Stuart uh, attended a workshop at Google on quantum biology. Yeah. Is it time to start thinking in terms of quantum biology? Quantum biology, yes. I had some slides, and maybe we'll talk about them tonight. Um, Quantum biology um, is the emergent field. I would say that, in my view, biology perhaps is even more fundamental than physics. I, it's hard for me to say that because I'm a physicist. <laughs> but um, it, it looks like, in the reductionistic approach, that building up, remember I showed you the scales, building up from the, uh, all the way from the atoms, or even below that, the, the particles and maybe even the superstrings all the way to molecules that eventually give you DNA. To get biological systems to work, it just, there's nothing in physics, there's nothing in the, in the dynamical laws of physics that will give you that. Well, I was thinking the other day, and perhaps this is too reductionist and we'll close with this. Yeah. But life is biology, would you agree? Life is biology. And would you agree that biology is chemistry? Biology is chemistry. Would you agree that chemistry is physics? Uh, and, and I know where you're going. It's uh, strings, etc. And of course, ultimate is vibrations. Well, I was going to go a little slowly. <laughs> Would you agree that physics is quantum mechanics? Yes. Would you agree that quantum mechanics is mathematics? Um, I would take quantum mechanics into vibrations, and then I would go to mathematics, yes. And would you say that mathematics is in consciousness? I would say mathematics and consciousness, and therefore, ultimately, perhaps, all of this is, is in a platonic realm, and maybe Plato was right, after all. Thank you, Dr. Mendes. <laughs>